spoke on this at a local church. A woman approached me at, at the end of the service and <clears throat> said, we just finished this journey with our two-and-a-half-year-old child. She wrote, she wrote a book about it, which is her, the compilation of her journal reflections. And the, <clears throat> the, it's, I mean, it, in, in my view, it's the most painful journey you can imagine to do that with a child. Now, follow up for all of you who have walked through this with a loved one of some sort. Uh, is any, any of you involved in making decisions about treatments and life support? Yeah? For who? Yeah. Grandpa? Okay. Was it, were, was it a... It was, were any of you in the position of sort of being the sole decision maker? Yeah? For my mother. Okay. Did you have siblings or were they just no. not very helpful? No, I'm, I'm an only. Okay. All right. Um, in fact, I, I, I sat with a woman yesterday whose mother has ju just got the diagnosis that she has end stage lung cancer. And her siblings have all deferred to her and said, you know, I, I basically said, I can't go there, so you've got to do this. Uh, right? when, I, when, I, when I spoke on this in my own church, you know, there were probably, I bet there were probably 2,500 people there on that day. And when I asked, I asked these same questions in my church. And on the first one, how many, how many of you have walked with a loved one through this? Probably 80% of the hands went up. And when I asked the second one, how many of you have had to make decisions about life support? Probably half of people's hands went up. Right? The only question I raised that didn't get a lot of hands up was when I asked, how many of you felt well prepared? For, for making these decisions and for this journey. Virtually nobody raised their hand for that. The only, basically, the only people who raised their hand, my guess, is for whom this was not the first experience. And I, and I think I probably would have been one of those that raised my hand, only because we've done this with three of our parents now two on my wife's side and my dad about three years ago. Um, so what I, you, you, I mean, one, you will all do this eventually, you know, unless you're completely estranged from everybody who's important to you and your family, uh, which I suppose is possible, but not, hopefully not likely. Uh, and you, you ought to be prepared to make decisions about treatments and about when the time is right to say stop. And I'm going to argue theologically that there is a, a time, we may not be able to pinpoint it very well, but it is, it is theologically appropriate to tell medicine at some point to stop. Right? And we'll come to all of that. Uh, this most of, if you minister to adults, most of the people you minister to will, will walk down this road eventually. And the, most people who go down, who, who walk this journey, feel completely unprepared for it. Okay? The culture doesn't help us. The medical profession doesn't help us much. They don't give us, you know, a lot of tracks to run on, on this. And, I mean, the, the norm, I think, in terms of people's experience is that they're figuring it out as they go along. Right? Now, one more question, and if this is too convicting, we can move on. Uh, how many of you have advanced directives or living wills for yourself? You're not sure? 
then you probably don't. <laughs> okay? Or at least you need to review it. Okay? You do? Okay. So basically, one, two, three, four, is it? No? Okay. This, I, this is a little bit below the national average, which the national average is abysmal. And this is worse. <laughs> um, okay. The reason this is important, in fact, if I had my way, you couldn't pass a course without filling out a valid advanced directive. But since that's probably illegal to make that requirement of you, I won't, I won't do that. Um, but I, I'm considering there's another document that's not a, it's not a formal enforceable advanced directive. It's a document called Five Wishes. You want to Google Five Wishes. Uh, it's a really good resource. I might, I might bring that in and have, make that available to people. Um, but think, think about, do you, guys, do you know how old Terry Schiavo was when she lapsed into a coma or a vegetative state? Well, that was not really, that wasn't my question. She was 27. She was 27 years old. Uh, I suspect lapsing into a coma and somebody else trying to figure out what her wishes were at age 27 was not at the top of the list of important things to do. What that illustrates is, God, God forbid, how quickly something like this can take hold of a person's life. And in, in my view, she illustrates that it is never too early to do this. Right? I'm totally convinced that if she had written down her wishes, this would never, I mean, n none of us would ever have heard of her if she had simply written down what her wishes were. Um, okay, so I, I, would, I would really encourage you to give thought to that. Um, if you have aging parents, it's a, t it's a tough subject to broach with them. But since chances are good that you're going to be in the position of having to sort out what their wishes are, it's better not to have to do that in ignorance. Now, I mean, I had this discussion with my own parents you know, long before my dad got cancer. And... We had discussions about it. They had it written down. He was crystal clear about what he wanted. In fact, he made it so clear that he said something to the effect of, if you let me linger on, I'm going to be furious. He said, I, I will be up in heaven taking names. <laughs> something that, now theologically, he wasn't, I wasn't quite on target, but let's just say I got the point. In fact, they changed. Originally, my sister was the one who was supposed to, they had been assigned as their durable power of attorney for health care to make decisions for them because she was local. And they pretty soon figured out, after they went over all this stuff with her, they figured out that she wasn't, she wasn't going to stop anything. And she was, I mean, she couldn't do it. And so they replaced her as the durable power of attorney and made, made that me. And the joke was that, you know, that I'm going to pull, you know, doctor pull the plug here. Uh, and then, but I, my response was, who, who would you actually be more afraid of? Someone who might stop treatment prematurely or someone who would never stop at all? And the, their answer to that was really clear, that they, what they feared was the latter of those. And most people today, 
beyond the obvious fear of what their eternity holds. Fear that more than anything else. They, they are deathly afraid. And this is why I'm convinced this is one of the reasons why the movement toward euthanasia gains the traction that it does is because it's often seen as the, the only alternative to lingering on in a terrible condition indefinitely. And if, if, I, I, mean, if, I, if I were not a believer and didn't take the Scripture seriously, that, that would be an easy call if those were my only choices. In fact, I think even taking the Scripture seriously I got to think about that. <laughs> right? So, the, I think the, the big the big idea here, for you guys personally, is it's, it, it's it's really important for you to be clear about what you want and don't want. Should you lose the ability to speak for yourself and to to Write that down and make sure you talk to somebody who's going to make decisions for you. Talk to them so they get the spirit of what you want. Okay. Right? Now, I know for some of you, <laughs> having that conversation with your parents is a profoundly uncomfortable thing to think about. And there probably are some parents that don't, they just don't, they won't, they're not going to go there with you. And if that's the case, then, you know, so be it. Um, but, if you, I mean, if you think about it, the, the, burden of, the burden of ignorance that that places on you as the decision maker is off the charts. I mean, we deal with families on this all the time. And most of them feel pretty significantly put upon that they don't have anything to go on for making these decisions. And I don't, I don't want my wife to be in that position. And my folks didn't want me to be in that position. Right? Now, they were concerned ultimately about themselves first. To be, to be sure that their wishes were followed, they, they had to be clear about it. Okay? If I brought in the five wishes thing, would you guys, would you guys take that seriously? And have, would, you, would you use that as a conversation starter with, so, with someone? Okay, I'll do that then. All right, I won't hold you to it. That won't be an assignment. But the tempting. What does it look like? Not much different. It just has to be witnessed, signed and witnessed. Somebody you trust. No, it's just anybody you trust. Uh, I don't think it, some states I think require a notary, but not in California. And every hospital is required by law to have advanced directives available and somebody there to kind of give you some direction on how to fill them out. In fact, when you check into a hospital, you should be asked if you want to fill one out, which is probably not the best time to do that. And the last time we were asked was when my wife went in to deliver our third child. And I thought, you know, this is not really a great time to be talking about this uh, because I was presuming she was going to come out of delivery just fine. Um, so if you want help, also there are forms available just at the, from the, the state of California's is actually not too bad. So it's probably a good place to start. LegalZoom would have those. Um, so uh, it just a little bit of digging on the web can help you too. And what you're looking for in this is, is not only you know, details of things that you want and don't want, it's not good enough to say, I don't want life support, or I don't want extraordinary measures, right? That's almost, it's, I mean, it's not useless, but it's pretty close, right? What, you, what they need to know is, do you want 
CPR? Do you want mechanical ventilation? Do you want feeding tubes? And so on. There's a list of about 10 or so treatments that you can opt in or out of. What you also want is the, the conditions to be clear for when it's time to invoke the advanced directive. Okay? Because, I mean, I suspect if, you know, if you if your heart stopped right now, I suspect you'd have really strong feelings about wanting CPR to be done. Okay? But, you know, my dad, at that end stage of cancer, somebody coming in there beating on his chest and probably breaking some of his ribs was the very last thing he wanted to be done. Um, so the conditions under which, you know, the terms of the directive can be invoked are also really important to spell out. Okay, so anyway, those are the things you want to look for. All right? Any questions on that? Okay. Now, in, in this discussion, we are going to distinguish between three different things. Okay? And these are all qu quite different. Right? Most of what we're going to talk about in here is the termination of life support because those are the decisions, at least for now, under the law, that are on the table. Okay? And unless you live in, in fact, that's the, that should have been a bonus question. Man, it should have been. What are the three states where assisted suicide is legal today? Oregon, Oregon Washington, Washington, and Montana. Montana right? Wasn't that's right, because Montana passed the law after the book came out. Okay, so unless you live in unless you live in those states, that's probably not enough for a fourth edition. Um, <laughs> unless you live in those states, this is off the table, and unless you live in parts of Europe, this is off the table. Okay, there is no state in the United States, maybe one province in Canada where this is legal. I'm not sure about that. But I don't, I don't think there's any place in North America where, this, where euthanasia is legal. Okay? Now, everybody understand what, what is the difference between assisted suicide and euthanasia? Uh, well, assisted suicide, the physician is giving the resources to the patient, the commitment. Himself or herself. He's the right. causal agent. He's like an accomplice that gets his way out of the thing. Okay. Good, okay, that's right. Now, yeah, generally euthanasia is, is, is performed, at least the idea was that euthanasia would only be performed when the patient was too sick to participate in assisted suicide. Because some patients are, I mean, they're in a vegetative state, they're in a coma, you know, they're at you know, end-stage dementia or Alzheimer's, you know, things like that, and they just, you know, they even if it were legal, they still can't do it. Okay. Now, in, there are some parts of the world where this is, I'd say, firmly legal and other parts where it's loosely legal. Okay. Where the Dutch, for example, for years had a law on the books prohibiting euthanasia. But uh, if certain conditions were followed, then N nobody got prosecuted. And the number of people who actually got prosecuted was, you know, minuscule. Uh, so to my, to my knowledge, uh, Belgium, um, the Netherlands, and I believe most of Scandinavia allows for euthanasia. And in other, in other parts of Europe, it's practiced and I say probably the, the dirty little secret is, is that it's practiced here in the U.S. more often than we'd like to admit. Just for, for example, I take a group of students periodically to uh, the, the ICU at uh, USC's University Hospital. The director and assistant director are both Christians, and they're great folks, and they always welcome us, and they... You know, they force the residents to present their cases to us, and so they consider it a learning thing for them. 
the director told me that uh, this was years ago, one of the surgeons who had done cancer surgery and this patient was in the ICU to recover, took a terrible turn for the worst and the surgeon actually ordered what, what uh, the ICU director referred to as an alcohol drip, right? which is essentially introducing alcohol into the IV line basically to administer euthanasia, to give him a sort of a slow alcohol poisoning. Uh, and I just, I, 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 was, I was just stunned that that kind of thing would happen. And he said, he said the only authority he had, the ICU director, was he basically kicked him out of the ICU and said, you're not going to do that in my unit. I consulted on a case a few years ago where it was obvious to everybody that euthanasia had been performed because they had the patient not complained of pain at all, but a huge overdose of morphine had been given, which is, you know, it's just not, it's not, a, I mean, no, everybody knew what had happened. And the ethics committee was convened to decide whether we should report this to the coroner's office or not, which we did, and that was an easy call too. But the response from the coroner was disappointing to say the least because the coroner actually said we have so many of these come into our office that we don't we just don't have the manpower to investigate them all I thought god god help us if that's the case okay, so so i mean assisted suicide and euthanasia happens in places regardless of what the law is. Okay. I'll tell you a little bit more about the situation in the Netherlands here after a while. Um, but I think the, on both of these, the scripture, it seems to me, is pretty clear. And the real issues here, I think, <clears throat> have not to do with personal decision making on this, but on what public policy should be. Okay. This area is the one that's a lot more complicated in terms of individual decision making. Now, I think the theological parameters for that are pretty clear, which we'll spell out. Um, but making decisions, I mean, making decisions about these are yes or no. Right? Making decisions about these are when. I mean, if, when, and under what conditions. And there are much that, that, that I mean, the, the context of these are much, is much more complicated. Uh, so we're going to spend most of our time on this. Not going to do a lot with the public policy component. Uh, we'll, we'll briefly address some of the primary arguments that support assisted suicide and euthanasia. And it's, I mean, it's not like you can't make a plausible case. All right. Um, all right. Questions on that? Yes. So do I have it right that you said there's three states that it's legal to do assisted suicide, but no, no states it's legal for euthanasia? That's correct. Okay. That's right. Now, actually, there are probably a couple more that are coming for assisted suicide. To, to my knowledge, euthanasia is not really on the table uh, in terms of the law. Right? Now, one, one of the arguments actually against assisted suicide is that morally, there's not a significant difference between assisted suicide and euthanasia. Uh, and so one of the concerns is that what starts out as assisted suicide will eventually become euthanasia. Right? Now in Europe, they didn't make that distinction all that carefully. So they, you know, they, they called it simply aid in dying. Um, so here, we've tried to draw a little tighter line. Whether that can be sustained or not, 
is, I think, is anybody's guess at the moment. So have there been cases? Yes. They're promoting, they're saying, let's go to euthanasia that have been rejected? Legal not, not that I'm they're aware of. Be, yeah, not that I'm aware of because I think the proponents of general aid in dying are all, they're also, a lot of them are politically real savvy and they know not to overreach. Because what, what people are concerned about is uh, euth euthanasia that's done without consent. It's a lot tougher to do assisted suicide without consent, though I think that's possible too. But the idea of euthanasia without the patient's knowledge or without their consent is that's the end product that really scares people, and rightly so. Yeah. I was living in Oregon when the physician assisted suicide bill went through, and, and the extreme end on that group that was pushing that bill was actually in favor of euthanasia. And I think they pushed it so that they could, quote, settle right. on PAS. Right. Right. So when, there's, when, yeah. there's a contingent out right. there. That, well, I, there's no doubt that. Assisted suicide is not the end of the story for, for, for proponents of aid and dying. Um, and in fact, whether, in fact, I think, there's a, you know, I think it's actually debatable whether consent is the end of the story, too. Uh, but that's another subject. Yeah, one more. So your mm -hmm. concern regarding assisted suicide, your concern is the same as with euthanasia, coercive? Right, yeah. right, right. Because I, th I think it is, it is, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see somebody signing an assisted suicide uh, consent form under duress that nobody will ever know about. Because those are private, those are all private conversations. Okay? So that's, uh, no. <laughs> Let, let, yeah, let's hope not, okay? Now, what, I'm, what I've skipped on the slides here is the support study. Let me just, I'll just say a really quick word. The, the reason I'm skipping it is because it's almost 20 years old. But the support study is what first sort of really got the attention of the medical profession about the... How, how, how dying was managed, how the end of life was being managed in hospitals. And the consensus came back, George Annis, who's a law professor at Boston University, wrote in his commentary on the support study, he said, the conclusion of this is obvious. If you are dying, don't go to a hospital. And if you're in one, get out. <laughs> But for, for example, one of the things that they found is that 50% of a 10,000 10, patient survey, 50% of patients or families reported that they were in moderate to severe pain in the last three days of their life. And that, that's the other thing that people are really afraid of, is that their pain's not going to be controlled. Okay? So in, sort of in response to this, about 10 years later, a consortium of Catholic hospitals, one of which was the health system that I consulted with for a long time, did their own survey called the Supportive Care of the Dying Project. And this, their findings, I think, have a lot of relevance for pastors and for the local church who you know, are, the, are the, the people best positioned to come alongside family members and walk with them through the end of life. Okay. Here's what they found. This is what, in fact, it was a really a good approach because they said instead of presuming what dying patients and their families want and need at the end of life, let's ask them. You know, hello. And here's what they said. In fact, I have the executive summary of this is posted on Blackboard. If you want to read it, I really encourage you to, to look. It's about a 15-page document that's really well done, yeah. This is probably mid-90s. 
Yeah, probably mid to late 90s. What they affirmed and is that they want to know the truth and they want to know have it communicated consistently and timely. Okay? They want to know the truth about their disease. About They want to know the truth about their prognosis. And they want to know the truth about the treatment options. Some cultures don't do this. Some cultures shift the burden of decision making from the patient to their family members. And sort of understand, I mean semi-understandably so, because they, as they see it, the patient's got enough to deal with, with their disease. And so the family members, this is particularly true in cultures that tend to be more patriarchal, the family, the, the oldest male in the family will just assume decision-making responsibility. And frequently they view the patient as someone who doesn't need to know these things. Or if they know the truth about their diagnosis, they'll give up. That's very common reason for withholding the truth. Right? I consulted on a case some time ago where the, the, the woman was Hispanic, spoke no English, and her son assumed this decision-making authority while also being the translator at the same time. And we discovered, you can see where this is going, we discovered that he wasn't facilitating the free flow of information quite like we had hoped. And his mom, all, all she knew was that she was sick and the treatment was going to make her hair fall out and make her sick to her stomach. And so we finally had to get, get another translator in. And with the son in the room, we asked her, do you want to know your diagnosis, what, the, what your prognosis is for the future? And she's kind of, you know, well... Duh, you know, of course I want to know that. And the son was, I think, appropriately chastened for his role. But, but he was good-hearted about it because he was, you know, he was assuming that responsibility and that's what he had always been taught that he was supposed to do. Okay. What you have to tell people in this culture, in a, under American law, that's, that's illegal to do unless the patient has said, you know, you can make decisions for me. Okay. And the law now allows for patients to, make, to, have, to appoint someone else to make decisions for them before they lose the ability to do that themselves. Okay. So at the least, what, what you have to do is you have to say to your dad, you know, dad, do you want me to make decisions for you? Or do you want to make these decisions yourself? Okay. Right, so the patient can give up that decision-making responsibility, but only by consenting to give it up. You can't, you can't take that away from someone without them telling you that that's okay. Right? But you don't have to be at the, you know, at the end stages of Alzheimer's before that decision-making authority can be removed. Right? Now, obviously, if they're not competent, which by that we mean capable of making your own decisions, if they are incompetent, then somebody else has to make decisions for them. Okay? But if they are competent, if they're capable, then it's their decision until they tell you otherwise. Okay? That's the ground rule. Okay? And you, I mean, you'd be stunned at how many times adults are treated as though they are incompetent just because they are old or sick or don't speak the language. Okay? And that's wrong to do that. It's also illegal to do that. Okay, so be, be really careful with how you do this. Second, 
this was really important. I, I, didn't even, I never thought about this until it, this came out. But dying patients and their families want to be treated the same. In other words, what, what, what he meant by that is that decisions about a dying loved one has huge effects on the family members who are taking care of them. Now, medicine typically only looks at the well-being of the patient. Somebody, translate, local church community, has to recognize the toll that caring for a dying person takes on a family, particularly if it's a, an, an older spouse who's the only caregiver. My mom nearly went under from taking care of my dad. And I think one of the reasons she took him back to the hospital so quickly was that she was going under emotionally. I mean, had my wife and I not sort of, you know, seen the alarm bells go off and stepped in, I mean, she, she, was head, she was headed for a really bad place. And nobody, nobody, nobody in the hospital saw that or did anything about it. And this is where, you know, you, I mean, you can bet when somebody's got cancer, the family needs the church. Family needs you guys. Okay. Now, I think the patients need you too. Um, and you are, you are the ones, and I, I mean, the hospital chaplains are, I mean, those are great folks. And some are better than others. But the, you guys are the ones who are the best suited to walk with people through the end of life because you know them. You know their values. You share their worldviews. You've shared life with them. That should be you guys doing this. You guys should be the ones helping them navigate these decisions because you know them, and you know, their, you know what's important to them. Okay? So don't, don't call me. Okay? You guys walk with them through this. I'm going to give you enough, I think, to make you hopefully more than dangerous with this. Okay, here's a third. This is, this is really crucial. And what this indicates is how significant the end of life is as a time of ministry in people's lives. Because I'm telling you, there is nothing like impending mortality to sharpen people's view of their spiritual life and of eternity. I mean, there is nothing else like that. I'm, con I'm convinced that we miss loads of golden opportunities, not only to talk to family members who may not know the Lord about the gospel, but also to have significant ministry in the lives of dying patients. Here's what they said. There's a really important component with, with closure, with relational closure at the end of life. Like one of the, one of the most, I would say, one of the tragedies of so much of what happens at the end of life is that our loved ones die before we've had a chance to say everything we want to them, and vice versa. I'm so, I'm, I am so grateful that I got to sit down with my dad and tell him everything I wanted to before he died. I did that, I did that a, probably two months before he died. And I thought that, that would have been tragic had I not been able to do that. Now, some, granted, some people get, they get run over by a bus, and you don't get that chance. But 
what, what, our, what, what the family members need from, from us as a church community is to help the physicians give them a heads up that the end might be coming. Doctors typically, and this, this, I mean, be careful about overgeneralizing, but doctors typically don't do this. What typically happens is doctors will give hope, 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 hope while they are processing the patient's decline. But it's not, it's, it's not the norm that they let the family members in on the on their processing that decline. And so typically what happens is that we go from hope, hope, optimism, hope, hope, optimism to we think further treatment is now futile. And the family thinks, you know, excuse me, you know, what? Because they're completely unprepared for that. And this is why so many families, sometimes they dig in their heels and won't consider stop saying enough to medicine. And I don't blame them for digging into their heels. And that's our fault for not preparing them for decisions that have to be made. Right? Now, I think there's a way you can do this, you know, without being the Grinch that stole Christmas. Right? I think you can say, you know, for example, my dad was 81 when he died. Three months before he died, he had major surgery. Okay? Now, it's not rocket science to think that he might not do great after what turned out to be a 10-hour surgical procedure at age 81 in an already weakened and compromised condition. But nobody ever said, we think the prognosis is, is going to be pretty good. But given his age and his overall physical condition, it should, we shouldn't be surprised if things don't go quite like we expect. Right? And in the event that happens, and we're not expecting that, but in the event that happens, you, you need to be prepared for some decisions that you might have to make. Okay. Or, or, may, or maybe we have, may, maybe if, you're, if your parent's in a nursing home and they go, you know, they just go back and forth to the hospital periodically. We, we had a term for those, and it's not a, it's probably, it's not a great kudos for the healthcare system, but we called we call them frequent flyers, that they would come back and forth from the hospital nursing home. And the interesting thing was, rarely did we ever say to someone, you know, maybe this hospital visit will go fine. You know, given, again, given their age and condition, it might be the next one or the next one after that that things are not going to go so well. Eventually, we're going to have a hospital visit where it's not going to go so well. And in that event, here are some of the decisions you're going to need to think about. Okay. Now, as pastors... That partially can be our job to help family members break through denial. Again, it's not a huge surprise that family members are in denial routinely about the severity of their loved one's condition. I mean, we've asked some people who are, we know they're terminally ill and they're going to die in the hospital. We ask their families what their expectation is for the treatment, and it's that they're going to walk out. You know, 
and, we, and we've had to say, you know, you know, unless Jesus returns, your loved one is not going to walk out of the hospital. Okay, so, you know, they, they, the patients and families told us they want this heads up when the end might be near, when these conversations might be appropriate. I mean, I think it's always appropriate to have those conversations whether they're dying or not. But it's also, they, they wanted a heads up about decisions they were going to have to make. Because these decisions about the end of life are not well made on the fly. And most families, the, I, my guess is the average is most families have at most a day or two to think about decisions about removing life support. Wouldn't it be nice to have three months to make those decisions, or longer. And I've had physicians who have said, they've said point blank, they've said, where is this person's pastor? Who can help them break through the denial that they're in? Because the physicians, they know that they're not trained to do this. I'd say it depends on what the dynamics are. Okay. I think in general, I think it's, it's, all, it's unless, unless the patient's incompetent, it's always best to talk to the patient first. Okay. Um, Do you talk to them in terms of um, them having an obligation to their family in, in the decisions that they have to make? Or? Well, I think if... if I mean, if the patient's capable of making the decisions, then the family's involvement doesn't need to be in a decision-making role. Okay. Uh, in fact, it, it shouldn't be okay. decision-making. Uh, then the family's there more for support, and, and our role with the family is strictly a pastoral one, not, not a decision-empowering one. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, are you... We all, anybody, we all clear about this? I mean, this, this, is, this is really important stuff. So that we don't miss opportunities that God brings to our, to our lives. Now, I know some of you are thinking, you know, I, I wouldn't know the first thing about a hospital situation or a setting like this. Okay? I would strongly encourage you to get some bedside education. Okay? And there are a couple ways to do this. Okay? If you, you may have physicians in your church who will allow you to tag along as they make hospital rounds. And if you, could, if you ask them specifically if you could come with them if, when they have an end-of-life discussion with the family, probably the better bet is to contact the hospital chaplain at you know, St. Jude's or um, you know, St. Joseph of Orange or you know, whatever your local hospital is. Tell them who you are. I'm a seminary student. I'm really interested in, in getting a bedside education uh, in hospital chaplaincy. And could I, you know, could I you know, make rounds with you? Could I hang out with you for, a, you know, you know, a couple hours once a month, you know, something like that. Uh, you know, Anita, Anita Regeer, the front desk, her husband is a chaplain at uh, Fountain Valley Medi Regional Medical Center. Uh, I told him I wouldn't send everybody his direction. <laughs> but he, I mean, he's already said he'd be delighted to have, you know, any students, you know, hang out with them. Um, uh, we've had, we've had a... He does. That's right. That's right. There, we have a we have a hospital chaplaincy class right. here at Talbot where he co-teaches. Yeah, and he's I mean he's he's an old pro, and it's sort of he's he's typical of the you know there's a whole 
network of evangelical hospital chaplains that he's a part of. Now, some chaplains you get are going to be rabbis or priests, and you know the degree of theological alignment, you know, probably varies widely. Uh, so that's why, I mean, you're you're really the ones who are best situated to do this, all right? Now, one, just one, one other comment here about advanced directives. Patients and their families expected those to be followed. Okay. Now, sort of important caveat for decision makers. Okay. These are sometimes called surrogate decision makers. They're the people who the advanced directive appoints to make decisions if they can't any longer. Okay. And that, that role, of surrogate decision maker, I'm not trying to put it any clearer, that is not a hermeneutical function. Okay. You with me on that? It is not your place to, in, to reinterpret the advanced directive or to conclude that, you know, dad couldn't possibly have meant this or to somehow think that you've got a better idea. Now, that there can be legitimate debate over whether the conditions set forth to invoke the advanced directive are, are, are here. All right? Now, we can, we can have, that's a legitimate place for some discussion. But once it's clear that the time is right for the advanced directive to be invoked, then your role as the decision maker is to enforce the terms of the directive, not to reinterpret it, or not to redo it. Okay, you with me on that? And, that's, and you, you can play a very helpful role with family members who think they have a better idea than what their loved one actually took great pains to write down. I mean, under the law, <clears throat> it's tough to enforce it, but it's te technically it's illegal to, uh, to, not, to not follow a validly written advance directive. Now, sometimes physicians, this is where physicians need you guys again, because sometimes physicians, not sometimes, most of the time, physicians have a, a difficult time standing up to families who are really aggressive in asserting their wishes. Right? speaking to a group at a hospital yesterday and I told this to a group of nursing students. I said I was I was talking I was I was lecturing at a at a education session for physicians some time ago and I was making this making this point that uh, physicians don't always have to follow the family's wishes. And this gentleman esteemed physician stood up in the back and he looked at me like I was this naive academic. And he said something to the effect of, this is how it works in the real world. Okay. And, this, and this now is a direct quote. He said, if the patient tells me to stop the treatment, but the family tells me to keep going, that I'm going to keep going. You can see where this is headed, right? Because, this is again a direct quote, the patient's going to die and the family will still be around to sue me. At which point I said, sir, with all due respect, I am delighted that you are not my physician. Technically, if that patient has an advanced directive 
following the family's wishes in contradiction to the advanced directive is illegal to do. Right? And again, this is where I, I'm, I'm telling you, physicians will be forever grateful for pastors who come alongside the family and enable them to face reality about what their loved one is actually dealing with and what the prognosis is. Right? And one thing you can ask the family is to say, what, you know, how do you understand the prognosis? You guys don't know what I mean by that term? The prognosis is what their prediction is for the future, for this patient. Right? Another way to put this is to ask the family, what, what, how do you understand the goal of care for your loved one? Okay. And then the $64,000 question is, is the goal of care consistent with the prognosis. Sometimes that's really helpful. Right? Another, another way to help families with some of this decision making is just to, is to put them in the position where they ought to be, representing the, the wishes of their loved one. And I, I've, I mean, I've told families over and over again, I said, if your dad or grandpa could speak for himself, what would he want? What do you think? If your grandpa, I mean, families who get requests, you know, to sign a, a do not resuscitate order, they have no clue what to do with that. Right? So we said, so the question is then, if Dad could speak for himself. Do you think he would want CPR if his heart stopped? And a lot of times the family will say, well, of course he would say no to that. I say, there's your decision. Especially if it's, if it's almost self-evident as to what he or she would say, the clearer your decision. Right? Because again, your job is not to do what you think is best. Your job is to represent the wishes of your loved one. Most families have a terrible time saying stop to medicine. And in some cultures, it is really difficult to do that because family members lose face if they don't do everything for their loved one. That's, we'll talk about that next time. That's a very tough challenge when culture won't let you do what I think Scripture not only allows us to do, but in some cases encourages us to do. Now, next time we will we'll be we'll be sort of off the pastoral side of this. We're going to go. We're going to look briefly at some theological underpinnings for death and dying, and we're going to make the argument that the Scripture allows, under the right conditions, to say stop to medicine, and then in some on, on, under some conditions, we're obligated to say stop. All right, and that that's not. That's not contradictory to the sanctity of life or to the idea that God works miracles. Okay. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.